so uh, Jordan was asking, can I join the Twitter space early? Which, of course, no. Of course not. Of course no. not, because that would be a useful feature. And I'm like, look, one of my top feature requests is a green room. And Jordan apparently – is green room not a common term? I no. Oh, gosh. It's the children that are wrong. No, uh, well, so Jordan's like, what? I, and I, Jordan, I'm sorry, that must have sounded very peculiar to someone who never heard of the term. So, so Lukeman, you just joined us. Can you can you hear us? Hello. Yeah, hey, I hear you. Hey, there we go. <laughs> All right, Lukeman, gr- green room. Is this a term that has any meaning for you whatsoever? Not at all, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, the, 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 yes, the, the generation is broken. I mean, I I could infer from context, but I did want to hear you. Explain okay, so that. a green room is a, a a room in which one waits to to be a performer, the, the, where uh, it is often backstage. Uh, it's got you know, it's got it's catered in the so the. I went. I'm like, what's the thing before like late night televisions? Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. People yeah, yeah, yeah. in the green. Yeah, everyone knows that. Surely. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, surely we've all been in front of. Yeah, Kanye, exactly. You know, like it's like when you're on Kimmel, right? I mean, right, Josh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, just the other day I was on Letterman. <laughs> right. Yeah, but he, oh, right. he was hawking his NFT, so don't uh, don't read too much into that. But <laughs> so the uh, but where is the origin of the term green room? And you go to the green room Wikipedia page, and it's like, because the room was frequently painted green. And I'm like, you are not going to leave it at that, Wikipedia. Fortunately, there is an entire section below on possible sources of the term, and it goes back to London's Blackfriars Theater, 1599. So this is an old term. Um, anyway, if Wikipedia is to be believed, which it... Sure, let's do that. <laughs> let's do that. Let's experiment with that. Yeah. Anyway, they don't have the feature, so you're welcome to the green room, everybody. It's the same thing as being on stage, so we, we, right. we just kind of pour out. Um, but Jordan and Lukeman, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Um, and so, Jordan, I want to kick this off with uh, your uh, this NVMe bug that you found. Um, we're talking about debugging methodology today, and uh, the, in particular... Um, Jordan had this this terrific analysis of a problem, and then uh, when Lukeman hit a totally unrelated problem some number of weeks later, I also had a terrific analysis that he wrote up. And part of what I, I want to get to today that I love about both of these is both of you did a really, really good job of describing your methodology, which I feel, I mean, I don't think that happens that frequently. Uh, I feel that like... Often it's just kind of the solution is revealed as if a magic trick and people don't describe what they did. I don't know, Adam, do you agree with that? I d- d- totally agree. I, I agree. There are many bug reports that were sort of, I hit a problem and here it is. And I, what I love about both of these write-ups is the, um, to a degree, like the, the mystery and the, and the storytelling of them as well. And the, these methodology that, as you alluded to, Brian, is repeatable, right? Like I, I, it's not just, that if I read it, I understand this specific issue, but people can learn how to debug, uh, you know, uh, other types of issues in that vicinity by reading. So with that, Jordan, I, I think that we, maybe hand it over to you. Uh, one, uh, maybe you want to talk the, a little bit about the specifics of the bug as well, um, or, or go into kind of arbitrary depth there. But two, what, what prompted you to write all of this up and kind of have this, this narrative flow to it? Sure. Uh, so, first of all, if I don't write things down, particularly when I'm exploring a new area or something that isn't something that I really know really well, I will forget it. So, like, half the reason for writing it down is partly selfish, just because I want to remember what I discovered and learned. Um, another thing another thing that is very motivating for me to write stuff down uh, when debugging is that I have frequently come across bug reports where the bug seems extremely interesting but I have no idea how the person that debugged it figured it out. And there's a lot of, I mean, everyone has different context and experience and and knowledge. So some things might be obvious to some people and not others. Um, But as much as possible, when I write bug reports, I try to include enough context that someone that doesn't have as much experience could learn from it and figure it out. Um, 
I can talk about the specifics of the bug too. Yeah, if that's interesting. yeah absolutely. I think the specifics of the bug are interesting. Well, first of all, just I on that because I think that that's so interesting in terms of writing it down both for your future self, which I, I absolutely am with you that I really need to. I, you know, I keep a notebook at my side. I really feel that I need to write things down. I, I, it really helps me process things. But then I love the pedagogical approach too of teaching people how to debug. Because I mean, Jordan, I. I don't know. I mean, I believe that debugging can be taught and learned, but I'm not sure that everyone believes that. I, 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 and I, clearly you believe that. I definitely believe that. It's not it's not easy to learn, but uh, it's it's something that I think with more and more experience, yourself doing it and seeing other people doing it, it uh, you can definitely learn it. Um, but you, you hit a really good point there, Jordan, which is I think it is hard to learn in part because there aren't that many folks trying to teach. So I think it's great to see this kind of example where you know, people can learn from this. Like this is a, a strong example if someone wants to learn more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then do we, uh, yeah, do we get a little bit into the, into the bug itself too? Because the bug itself is, is pretty gnarly in that it's a failure mode that's in a, in a spot that's actually pretty tricky to debug. Yeah, sure. So um, Josh Kula, who I didn't know was going to be joining, but I see he's here, um, had encountered this bug originally. So we have some uh, lab infrastructure for Oxide. Um, and some of the machines, when they were rebooted, would seem to hang. Um, and so Josh was able to narrow it down to specifically the NVMe Quiesce path. Um, and because I have some experience with NVMe on Illumos, he asked me if I would look into it. So the first thing that I did, because this was a hang, I wanted to see if we could NMI the box and, and get a crash dump. But because of you want to just where, explain briefly what NMI is? Uh, yeah, just uh, I mean, s- send an interrupt to the box that um, I'm sure other people can explain this better than me. But that will generate a crash dump and and reboot it, right? Um, so then you can take that crash dump, attach uh, a postmortem debugger to it, and look around at the state and see what it was doing um, when you when you generated the dump. And, and to a non-maskable interrupt traditionally, like and and now this is getting into green room era nomenclature, but like this was a physical button or jumper that you would press like it, it, on, a, on yes. an actual box to like send an external interrupt. In, in Black Friars Theater in 15 <laughs> That's right, as, as we all recall, yes. You know, I don't know that there was ever, was there a physical button? Oh, I'm not, yeah, yeah, for, totally. sure, for, for sure. Uh, and, and often, I, I'll tell you from experience, they cost extra. And I worked for a company that didn't pony up. So I would at times be stabbing away at jumper pins with a knife from the kitchen to try to cause an external <laughs> interrupt. I think the, like the original Macintosh had a plastic yes, button yeah, you could uh, buy that would yeah. jam in a hole in the side to reach the thing, right? That's right. In like 1984. What what is this knife in the kitchen story? Did, okay, did I just hold on, hold on. did so, I just dream that? Like that no, is... no, no. I'll, I'll send you a picture. But we had a uh, then open Solaris box. This is when I was at Delphix. Um, that was that was hung mysteriously. So we we wanted to generate an external, uh, you know, a non-maskable interrupt in there, XIR, and um, and like we didn't we hadn't paid you know this is some random HP box. We had not bought the little jumper goober. It was going to take two weeks to get there. So. What I needed to do was short out two pins and the most expedient. This is Adam Leventhal hardware engineer. Hard I, was, yeah. I was Adam Leventhal hardware engineer, which so, often so. involves a running start, by the way. That's a running right. start That's is right. a, it's a key tool in the toolbox. That's right. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can post the, the picture of this, but um, I use this also, to generate also, the interrupt. Hewlett Packard seeking rent on a small piece of plastic and metal is pretty on brand. <laughs> it yeah, exactly. is pretty on brand. Exactly. Okay, I, you know, I just, I just never real. I think I'd always done this via IPMI or the BMC. I did. I guess I didn't realize that they had actual physical buttons. Um, yeah, but Jordan, sure. so Jordan, we, I, I'm sorry, we, we, we digress. Did you? Oh, that's all right. Um, so did, were you able, did you have to get out a knife? Did you have to go in to get out a kitchen knife or were you able to send an NMI to the, to this box? So no, uh, knife or otherwise. Um, my, my point was that this was not even something that was available at this stage of reboot. Yeah. Um, so, you know, other, other measures had to be taken. Um, and when you say it was not available, was this because the system had already been sufficiently quiesced that it was, we were kind of past the point where we could reasonably take a dump? 
Yes. Um, like the, these are some of the, the quiescing of the devices is some of the, the very last things that happens uh, before it goes away. Yeah, that's brutal. That is brutal. And this is the problem about, about a crash dump. We're relying on a flawed system to actually write its state to disk. And if that flawed system has already passed the point of no return, it's very hard to do that. Like we're, we're telling it to stop using the disk, actually. Right. That's actually what we're trying to do. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, so that's a good approach, that, but that's not going to work here. Right. Um, but so uh, we, we can still use KMDB. And a quick, do you want to describe KMDB in a sentence? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a debugger. Uh, the K is for kernel, I assume. Um, but it only, it basically stops the entire machine and is only running on one CPU. So normal MDB would not do that or normal MDB-K would not do that. Um, so basically if I'm on KMDB, no one else, no one else or nothing else can be using the Vox. Right. So this is an in situ debugger. The world is stopped when you're at the debugger prompt here. Right. Uh, and I can advance the instructions uh, like a like a step debugger, which is what I did. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was to figure out where I was hanging, uh, since I couldn't, you know, know that with a crash dump. So I set some breakpoints on functions inside of the NVMe quiesce function, which is where Josh had narrowed it down to. Um, and the very first thing I noticed was that it wasn't actually hanging, but that it was uh, looping. Um, hmm. So there's it, the MVB quiesce function does two th big things. One is uh, it will send a shutdown notification to the device, which is a part of the NVMe spec. And then it will do a reset of the device, which is another uh, thing to the, in the NVMe spec. And both of these are done by uh, writes to the control or configuration register. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I can, I can keep, keep digging in there. There's, there's a lot of stuff I did. Um, yeah. I mean, if you, it, 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 I mean, this is great. Sorry. You got the, the, I'm at the edge of my seat. I, you sure. I've kind of read this stuff. Yeah. So, uh, the, so, so I noticed that it was looping. Um, if you look at the, the code for NVMe reset, uh, what it does is it will write, uh, all zeros to the controller configuration register, which, the primary purpose of that is to clear the enable bit, which is how you tell the controller that you want to reset or enable the device. And so if you clear it to zero, that means you're wanting to reset it. And then the way that the controller tells the operating system that it's processed that is that it sets another bit in a different register uh, called the controller status register. And that tells the operating system that this device is reset and you can move on. And so basically what that loop was doing was checking that bit over and over again and never seeing that the controller had processed that reset. And these these are phenomena that are that are specified in the NVMe specification, correct? Yes. Yeah. Because uh, I think sometimes it's it, it is um, for folks that necessarily that haven't done necessarily low level systems programming, don't necessarily maybe they get accustomed to like documentation being poor. And when you get to these hardware standards, like the documentation is actually pretty good. I mean, the, the pretty complete, and you can go to the documentation for generally an authoritative answer um so i imagine you were going to the the you were going to the specification at least a decent amount to understand what the behaviors were of all these things yeah and it definitely definitely all the information i needed was there sometimes it can be hard to to figure out where you need to look right but uh they are pretty good um and i've spent some time in the nvme spec before so that definitely helped okay so you've got the you know what's what's kind of supposed to be happening here and then mm -hmm. what but what's actually happening well, it's that so it's checking for this bit, uh, the controller status ready bit to be set to zero, uh, and it's it's not seeing that ever. So it it's it's just it, there's a timeout that's specified in the spec, and that the code is kind of just like spinning uh, until that timeout is up, and then it moves on. And so what what this actually means is because of the the wait time between looping, uh, it ends up actually not hanging, but taking about 10 minutes to reboot, <laughs> uh, about two, two minutes or so per uh, device. So it will eventually actually reboot, which is better, I think, than hanging. But uh, you don't want to have to wait 10 minutes for your machine to reboot. Yes. And this is a, a variant of a timeout. And a, a poet I know once said something very <laughs> about, about timeouts. Mr. Kalula, would you like to do an out loud reading of your famous poem? <laughs> See, Josh has given up on us. 
after, after oh i'm here i'm here i'm here <clears throat> uh how's it go uh time out time out always wrong some too short and some too long bravo <laughs> words to live by excellent out loud performance thank you yeah, we're coming up on our oh. fifth year anniversary of that shanti <laughs> <laughs> also also like it is pretty ironic that I thought it had hung because I had waited only five minutes for it to read it. <laughs> Staring as you do after Queers at the prompt that does nothing. It doesn't even echo characters back to you. It's like, well, it's probably hung, right? Come on. It's, as it turns out, it's just, it, it is actually just in a very long time out very repeatedly. Yep. So, all right, so Jordan, we now know that uh, uh, timeouts, timeouts, always wrong, some too short, some too long. This seems maybe perhaps to be of the too long variety, but this is what the spec n- more or less says, right? Yeah, it was it was spec compliant for sure. That's always depressing. The so uh, was- the timeout and the control, like so, the timeout actually is from the device. So maybe the device configured something that was a little too long, but it was spec compliant. Okay. So how do we so, so why doesn't everyone see this problem and how do we how do we fix it? I guess that was the kind of the next batch of experiments. Yeah, I mean, I didn't put this in the analysis, but I, I looked at I have a, a Lumos desktop too with NVMe devices. So I kind of looked at that and made sure that it behaved in the way that we would expect and it did. Um, those devices also had a much smaller timeout, which was interesting. But um, yeah, so I didn't like really know what to look at next but one thing that i thought was kind of strange was the way that the controller configuration register was written to which is the the one that has the bit to reset the device um for most register writes and device drivers that i've seen um typically you'll do a read modify and then write write of the register so you'll read the value that was there just change the bits that you want to change and put it back and in this case it was just clearing all of them Right. Which might might not matter, but um, I wanted to see if it did uh, because this clearly is, is weird. So this was kind of where it got fun because I was able to change what things were actually getting written to the device without doing an operating system build. Um, that- yeah, I, I was almost going to call this like debugger driven development um, mm-hmm. because the you are kind of treating the debugger as a, almost a REPL for the system and changing the behavior of these devices and then observing how they change. Yeah, um, because because we're writing to, or because the value that gets written to the register is just an address in memory that is also in a register, it's all accessible you know, through the debugger. Um, and I had some help here from Robert Mustaki a little bit to kind of figure out how to trace the exact mappings of like the virtual address to the physical address and, and things like that. But once I had that tool, available it was pretty easy to iterate yeah that's really cool and so it uh and then you kind of in your analysis you you go into uh what happened when you did that um but then it ultimately ends in a a bit of a of a dry hole right yeah so i tried tried the read modify write path and the behavior didn't change so that was kind of disappointing and because i had gotten like some outside help to have figure out how to do this process, I was worried that maybe there was something I didn't understand, and I spent a bunch of time reading code, and like, like spent more time than I should have. And then I realized that it would be much more productive to just try something else. Okay, uh, so this is a really interesting point. Because I was going to ask you this earlier too, when you said that you were before doing this experiment, you felt like I'm a little stuck. I don't know what to kind of what to do. So you kind of just did something, which I thought was interesting. Like, all right, I'm just going to explore like this aspect of this problem, and I, I kind of find that that to be a in a kind of an important uh, psychological uh, kind of aspect of debugging. When you get stuck, it's important to actually unstick yourself by just trying to understand the system better. I think it's a, generally a good way to unstick yourself. Yeah, it's definitely something I'm very tempted to do. Uh, of like going in a deep rabbit hole trying to understand something without just experimenting right Um, experimenting i tend to find to be much more fruitful um so the thing i tried next was so i mentioned earlier that the nvme quest does two big things it does the shutdown notification and then the reset and the shutdown notification also writes to that same 
register, but a different set of bits. So I was curious if maybe I did that in one single register write, so do the shutdown notification and the reset in the same write instead of two, if it would behave any differently. Um, and my, my intuition about these things also comes from like some experience with dealing with NVMe firmware before, um, just... Right, right. So, <laughs> right. Which, this would, would be the first time that firmware would be fickle about this. Right, so it, it, in a previous life, uh, a joint when I was looking at some NVMe related things, I ended up debugging an NVMe or PCIe firmware uh, issue where a write to one like register of one device would affect another device, which is very what? strange. Yeah, that is very strange. Can you can you say just a little more about that? Yeah, so uh, the basically what we observed was if you powered off one of the slots, which is like where you plug in the disk. Um, using a command line tool, uh, another disk would report that it was removed, which didn't make any <laughs> sense because I could see that it wasn't removed. It was right there. Um, <laughs> great. But, that, that is a yeah. great bug. That, there is something just, it, I mean, just so chaotic about that bug. Yeah, so that bug was very fun, but it also like showed me that my, the, the abstraction of like registers maybe isn't always as clean <laughs> as I thought. Like that bug taught you to trust nothing or <laughs> you know, like I can, I can trust absolutely no one at any time. That's um, so, okay. So you've had this experience with like, with firmware doing things out of bounds. So wouldn't yeah. be the first time. So, Hey, let's try giving this something that giving us thing the rights in a different way. Let's see if it actually wants them as separate rights. And does that change anything? Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would mention about that previous firmware bug is that uh, when I was working on it, I got very frustrated that MDB could not tell me which bits were set because the way that these registers work is they're like a 32-bit value where you have set some bits, um, which is you know easier for computers to read than humans if you're just looking at a single <laughs> hex value. It turns out, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, Brian, you went and implemented the J format, which will take a a value and show you which bits are set and, and the masks uh, associated with it. And then I use that all over this bug and I was just like over that, that is so great. And, and, it, and it should be said that the J format character stands for Jordan and Jordan needed it. And so you don't know this Adam? <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, I hadn't seen lowercase J before. Very cool. I yeah. Also, like I, I don't, I don't doubt for a second that it stands for Jordan. I also wonder how many, Letters were available. Well, not very many. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I not to diminish. I think it not to diminish. jazzed up. It actually, I did feel like, I'm like, look, I can't just be like, Jordan asked for this in the man page. So I'm like, I got to find some way of justifying this. So yeah, I think it was jazzed up, which is pretty, still, it's pretty weak. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right there with flow indent. Uh, for... <laughs> Whoa! What is a, a flow indent? You, I'm sorry. You have you you, <laughs> Which you originally okay, stood for okay, minus half okay. for fancy. That is true. That is true. <laughs> Damn it! That's true. Yeah, no, anyway, I'm pretty top there. So yeah, yeah, some yeah, yeah. D-trace green room lore. You know, I had I had uh, believed my own marketing literature on that one. I had actually, I had actually kind of forgotten about minus half half was actually fancy for fancy, and <laughs> and, and I had. Flow indent seemed so plausible. I thought that I, but you're right. No, no, it was, it was, it was for fancy. Right. It was for fancy. All right. Anyway, for ja anyway. jazz, jazzed up binary. Cool. Yeah, and it's actually, it is actually super useful. Honestly, I, it's really I useful for feeble fire humans. Up yeah. MDB just to like get use the jazzed up format. Use the jazzed up format, and I feel that like this. I have to say, this is just a quick aside. One thing that I absolutely love about Rust is its ability to express binary literals and i know that like, that there are c extensions that do this as well but uh when you are it, when you're dealing in binary which you are with a register for example where where different bits represent different states it's very nice for the code to be able to also deal in binary and i have to jordan if i were to add something that maybe we should add something that jazzed up i love the underscores the arbitrary underscores that you can have in uh, to, in rust as a delimiter to make it a little bit easier to kind of count uh nibbles so holy smokes! I mean, that is such a minor breakthrough that was sitting oh, right there. Like, 
I that we could have had forever <laughs> and would have eliminated so many bugs uh, absolutely. just to let people not need to count digit. So, and when you use, are you referring to zero B as the, as the delimiter or are you referring to just the, the ability to have the underscore? Uh, actually just underscores, but yeah, zero B is obviously also like a game changer. And like, why, why couldn't we have had that when, when like why we had everything else, you know, else. yeah. When zero as a prefix stood for octal, like, uh, anyway, the, the underscore <laughs> is just, just it's, great. It's great. It's really nice. Uh, yeah, so Jordan, you, you are you, you're able to interpret the binary quickly of all these registers, which is very helpful. Um, and uh, it's only, and I should also say that the, the uh, on the one hand, it's I mean obviously it's great to be able to use this thing in planet. I feel we have done this. We collectively have seen this so many times over in our careers, where when we needed something, we stopped and implemented it, and then we were really grateful later when we were debugging something else to have the thing that we had stopped and implemented years prior months or years whatever prior and I, I i do feel that like something that we 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 really culturally encourage at oxide is if you need the tooling stop and implement it because you're probably going to need it again it's probably not the last time you're going to need the tooling yeah absolutely that, that's one of my favorite things about our culture is the window because when you're building tooling that you know you think you might need it might save you 5 minutes by spending 5 hours writing it's, it's always hard to justify, but it's so great working with so many engineers who have seen the benefits so many times who can just remind you that you too have seen those benefits. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because it, it, sometimes it can feel like, what am I doing? Like, am I, I should be back. Like, I, I'm now I'm on four tangents deep. And, right. but it's, we, we, again, we've seen that pay off just so many times. Um, we definitely saw it pay off here. So, uh, so Jordan, wh where did you, so where did that leave you? Did the, um, cause I think that experiment also was a bit, uh, the, I mean, I love you about your write up is you're talking about these experiments and are like, okay, I tried this and that didn't work out. Now what? Right. So one thing that I hadn't mentioned here yet, uh, is that the shutdown notification, there's, there's two kinds that you can do for the spec. One is normal and one is abrupt. Um, and this code was using the abrupt shutdown notification, which seemed interesting. Hmm, yeah. And so I had wondered, can I do a normal one? Would that be fine? Um, I, I looked at the spec and uh, it seemed like the abrupt shutdown was kind of a heavier hammer than was really needed for this path. Uh, so I wondered if maybe just trying that would work. Um, so I repeated that same experiment of writing the notification and the reset and one right, um, but this time with normal shutdown. And uh, for the first time ever, the ready bit, which was the thing that <laughs> the reset was looping on, actually said that it was zero. So that was that felt like, OK, like there's something here with abrupt shutdown. The, and that must have felt great to have that you like, okay, I met, I, I, I've now tried a couple of different things, but boy, okay, now I've actually got a direction that's yielding progress. Yeah. And at this point, this was like a Friday <laughs> and it was probably like four o'clock and I just felt like I had like a Red Bull or something. Like I was very <laughs> to, to figure it out at this point. Uh, yeah, so then the last step was to just kind of go back to the normal path and split those back into two. So instead of changing what the reset does, just changing the normal shutdown notification, <clears throat> uh, the shutdown to use normal sh notification, and it worked. That's great and very yeah. satisfying. And then um, had you been writing this up as you'd been going through it, or did you, did you decide, like, hey, I really should like, write up everything I did here? Where, where, where was the, the kind of decision to write everything up? Um, so I kind of like, I had been taking scattered notes. Um, so this is something I actually wanted to mention. I feel like a lot of my debugging reports or bug reports are very like narrative and linear. Um, but that's not always really how it goes. Uh, it's yeah. only something that you can, for me, at least make sense of after the fact a lot of the times. Totally. Um, so once I figured it out, I immediately started to write it down because I was like, if I wait until Monday or something, <laughs> I'm going to forget all of this. So I, I wrote it down, um, posted it over the weekend. Um, but yeah, it, it, was, it definitely was not this clear until the end. Right. 
know? well and again i i mean i love the all the talking about the dead ends um and the things that didn't work the things you experimented with because i think uh, it allows people to one it allows people to understand i think one of the most important things to convey when teaching debugging is that there are a lot of dead ends there are a lot of things you investigate that don't go anywhere and you don't be fooled by the person next to you that seems to know the answer because they actually probably went down a bunch of dead ends as well and when we don't show that to other people we they can think like oh i can't debug this because i don't know the answer it's like, no, no 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 one knows the answer you need to actually like and you have to go explore these different paths so that's part of what i loved about the write-up that was really yeah, great agreed with that brian I, I think the other pathology that can come uh is that people kind of taking stabs in the dark or rather not having the level of rigor that you <sighs> described in this yeah and instead using this sort of pattern matching oral tradition of debugging where they say oh one God. time I saw an NVMe hang and it was this thing. So let's, you know, it, it must be that again. And I think that when you don't see the process and you don't see those blind alleys, uh, it can lead people to thinking that it's always kind of this monotonic magic. I, I totally agree. And like, I have a really hard, when people are like, oh, it's this, I, I know it's this. And they're kind of like, okay, wait a minute. We're like, let's gather some data. It's like, no, no, I've got a fix. Like I've pushed the fix. It's like, you pushed the fix to what? Where are we right now? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. What's the problem that we're it's fixing? It's like, are we, are we like, is this like moving fast and fixing things? Like, what do we, what do we think we're doing? And of course, like, oh, actually that wasn't it. And, oh, but now, no, no, it's this, it's this. It's like, okay, ah, yeah, you're giving me a headache. Can we just like, can we actually gather the data, ask the questions, do the experiments and like, let's get this thing like really, really nailed. And then we, yeah. we've got and total that, confidence. And that, and that is the power of tooling, right? Because yeah. I think we are, you know, intrinsically, or at least maybe I'm speaking for myself here, impatient, right? Like we want to see progress. Yeah. And Jordan, to your point, you don't, you did all of this without needing to take a, a turn of the kernel for each of these experiments. But there certainly was an era where that's what you would have needed to do. And by having, you know, KMDB and, and all of these facilities that allowed you to do all these experiments, I mean, it probably felt ponderous at the time, but much more expedient than it would have been without this kind of tooling. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And this is a hard problem without an in-situ kernel debugger. This is a hard one to, to this is actually really hard to debug. You're kind of like, you, you're going to take iterations on like a printf equivalent kind of because you can't even really log anything because this is a th – we're resetting the system. So all your state is going to be tautologically lost. And this is a really hard problem to debug in that regard. Absolutely. All right. So it's a good time to get, get Lupin in here. Um, and so, Lupin, you'd hit a, 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 a totally unrelated bug sometime later, um, mm -hmm. a, a rust seg fault. But you took us on a very similar journey to, to Jordan. Yeah, but actually, to clarify, though, it was uh, one of our other coworkers, uh, Patrick, who ran into it initially while they were trying to get us updated to, like, a newer Rust Nightly or something. And they were running into this issue where compiling even a basic example that used um, a library that used inline assembly was just causing <laughs> Rusty to crash and segfault. And, okay, so, Luke, do you have, like, alerts? Because, like... I feel you've done this a bunch of times at Oxide where like you feel there's like a disturbance in the force and you know, people are looking at a rust issue and all of a sudden like Lukeman is here, like with like, I, I just think you, you are very uh, tuned in when anyone is having a, 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 a challenge with the rust compiler in particular. I think it's just, I have this need to like get rid of that little white dot in element. So I'll just always like click through the channels and then <laughs> at least in the Oxide Rust one, I can understand a lot of things. So it's like, oh, maybe I can figure out what's going on here. <laughs> okay, interesting. That's great. Okay, so you, but you see, so you see Patrick has seen this issue and mm -hmm. this is something that you obviously know a lot about um, and you're, you're ready to go kind of take a swing on this. Do you want to describe the actual, the, the symptoms of the problem? Sure, yeah. Um, so I think um, it was like already reduced down to something pretty easy to just run. It was just like build an example from like the USDT crate. USDT here being the, actually don't remember what it stands for, but dy something dynamic tracing. <laughs> User land statically defined tracing. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, so it's like, okay, let's just run that and see what happens. And, you know, it's like faults. Okay. Um, and then it's kind of like going through the motions. Well, already, I think Cliff had narrowed it down to something failing in LVM, like the control flow construction failing. So it's like, okay, so something's failing in LVM. Usually that's because of maybe some kind of invalid IR that it's trying to work with. So let's just try to oh. verify the IR that we have. Huh. I was going to ask you, like, how many? Because I have, I don't feel I've seen that many Rust seg faults. And to be clear, so people understand, this is the compiler that is seg faulting. It is not mm -hmm. a Rust program; it's the compiler itself. Have you seen a bunch of these? Look, I mean, I mean, obviously you've been you've been in Rust for a long time, so maybe this has been more common, or, or maybe you've seen a bunch of these. I don't think in. They happen. I feel like these happen, especially more so around LVM upgrades. Interesting. Yeah, it's probably the time that you'd probably notice them the most. Um, but yeah, so it's like from there, it's just like okay, well, let's see if we can even just figure out if we're giving it valid IR to begin with. And you know, kind of got lost a little lost there because of the flags not exactly doing what they said they were doing because of a different bug <laughs> oh, and, and it is that flag is verify llvm ir right that's the flag that's not doing what it should be doing yeah or, right at the time yeah because um at some point lvm had switched from like a to a different pass manager and as part of that switch the way certain flags were handled uh changed and for some reason it was not respecting that one <laughs> and so it was like totally saying yeah no Oh, that's frustrating. So, I mean, all right, a couple of things here. One, I do think that one of the things, you know, and I've seen you do this a bunch of times where there are a lot of rust flags out there that can be passed to various stages and they can be really, really helpful in debugging these kinds of problems. I don't, Adam, have you had these? Have you dug into all the, there's a lot there. No, I, I mean, I've, I've seen the list and uh, only enough to like, you know, to be overwhelmed by the number of <laughs> options there. And so, look, on the one hand, it's great that, like, you know the tooling and, like, okay, I've got this tool I can use. And then it must be frustrating to be like, okay, that does not do what it's supposed to do. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. Yeah, so, so what's next? So that's, all right, that's not the, the this, this verify, the, the uh, verify LLVMIR is not doing what it should be doing. Actually, I should clarify. It was doing it by itself. It was when you combined it with a different flag. Huh. Right. <laughs> so when you yeah so it was saying yes it was outputting okay yeah so we are getting some invalid IR where like there's a basic block that doesn't end in a terminator instruction or something like that yeah and it's like okay well can we actually look at that so we see what it looks like um and so i was just basically trying to narrow it down to that and get that output so we can at least look at it see if it even looks right. It, 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 so, the, it, because this is a theme I think we saw with Jordan as well, where you're you're very good at kind of like being curious about it, like as opposed to being overwhelmed by it. Of like, oh my god, like how is this possible? It's mm -hmm. like, okay, like what can what questions can we ask about this IR? What is it about this IR that that is potentially invalid? Um, I, I think it's it, 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 and I think kind of stoking that curiosity is a really important part of the. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it too here is familiarity. Yeah, interesting. You know, it's like kind of knowing where to look and kind of what avenues might be interesting. I think definitely helps with not feeling as overwhelmed by it. But you can also just kind of decide to choose one place and sort of drill down there. Um, but it's kind of like balancing between how deep to go versus, you know, how wide to go sometimes. And I think something like Jordan said before, it's like having the intuition also really helps. Yeah. And of course, and then building that intuition over time yeah. by, just, by just debugging these things. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, you've got this thing uh, reproducible and are you able to, yeah. What, what do we learn about the IR as you're kind of asking these next questions? Yeah. So like once you actually tell it to verify, instead of crashing, it will tell you, okay, so, you know, there's this basic block doesn't end in a terminator. Um, Expression. It's like okay, um, and we we eventually figure out how to get it dumped out, and we're looking at it. It's, well, we see it's like a invoking the inline assembly, and then after that's trying to do a store, and 
the problem here is that yeah, invoke is supposed is the terminator expression. You're not supposed to have anything else in the basic block after that. So why is the store happening there? Um, and so from there, it's kind of like, for me, it was like, okay, well, now that I know what the IR looks like, I can kind of go backwards and see where in Rust we were, Rust we were generating that. And it's like, okay, so this is where the inline asm thing is happening. And that store, at least in the IR, looks like it was storing the result, um, like one of the outputs. So it's like, okay, where are we doing that in Rust C? And okay, what does that kind of look like? So how do you answer that question? Like, where is this store coming from? How do you, like, what tools are you using to answer the question about where that's happening in Rusty? Um, I guess knowing sort of the structure of how yeah, interesting. Okay. Rusty kind of does this. Uh, <laughs> again, it's kind of like knowing where to look sometimes. Yeah. Um, but also, yeah, some, I also just will use like rip grep to just like show me all the places that have, uh, you know, the inline as a, yeah, like AST type that they're manipulating and just kind of look at them. You know, there's probably yeah. only so many places that are relevant. So I feel that there is, and if someone knows knows of one, I would love to know. I feel that there is a missing code, Rust code exploration tool a la Cscope. I, Adam, do you use Cscope on Rust? No, I use Rust Analyzer and it's amazing. And so, I don't know, I don't yeah, know yeah. how you live, honestly. Like, I, you, you're, it's, it's, it's just hard for me to imagine. Yeah, yeah like definitely. That. I use Rust Analyzer as well. And it's like, yeah, you can, and it's like very simple. It's like, okay, well, show me all the references that call, you know, this method or whatever, and you know, just look through them. And I mean, so, yeah. Rust Analyzer is so good. Like, I have a hard time looking at code review because Rust Analyzer, like, annotates everything with all of these unstated types, and it just can orient you in space in, uh, in a way that, like, I now find lo load bearing for understanding Rust. And mm -hmm. even when you are not writing Rust, but just trying to understand a foreign code base, you will use Rust Analyzer. Uh, even just the jump to definition button yeah. that you can push in your editor, it makes everything. A Look, this is an better. intervention, Brian. I, and, uh, this obviously is. I was especially <laughs> all the, <laughs> the, I, the other know, thing I, is good is the you hover over something and it'll tell you what type it is. It's great. Or you can have them like slightly faded, but like sh still show up, like the inlay. I think that's what they call inlay type hints. I, I need to get all the way there with the Rust Analyzer. I'm clearly living in a barn. I, I I get that message like loud and clear that I need to actually like. I, I there are better tools I need to use. So talk about better tools. The, the, I need, the yeah. neat thing about the LSP stuff is that you can both live in a barn and have have <laughs> like running water. It's good. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Like a rustic barn, like a like a bed and breakfast barn, a Vermont bed yeah. and breakfast barn, <laughs> fancy barn. That's the, that's the way. All right. Yeah, I, I want to live in a fancy barn. Okay. So clearly, that. Well, thank you for answering my question. Namely, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you could <laughs> like, I definitely also had like Rust Analyzer set up for like the you know the checkout of the Rusty code that I had. So it's like easy to kind of jump around in the code with that. You know, it's like okay, I see this call. Just you know click and go to the definition, you know? It makes yeah. it a lot easier when you're sort of jumping around and just exploring too. Yeah, I'm embarrassed to say how I've been living, but... Um, <laughs> so yeah, not, so do we not, use Cscope for well. Rust? No, we don't, Brian, great question. <laughs> we don't know what <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't do no, I mean, I was like, I was asking for me. I was asking for a friend. I, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I have a friend. <laughs> obviously, use Rust Analyzer. I mean, yeah, no, I just don't know how to tell it to this jerk. All right, yeah. Anyway, moving right along. Um, so, okay, so you actually, that's actually good. That, honestly, that's good to know. Is I, I, I guess I didn't realize that folks were using Rust Analyzer on code bases other outside of being an IDE and using it purely as a code exploration tool on another source base. So that's actually, that's very helpful to know. And I need, I obviously need to start using this thing. Um, and yeah. um, sorry, so you're using that to figure out where is this Ray store coming from? Yeah, and actually, I guess part of it's also like, once I saw the LVM IR, it's like, okay, well, we know the IR is like invalid. What about from Rust's perspective? So it was kind of trying to, there's like a whole little journey about trying to dump out the Rust mer, so the, <laughs> middle, is that what it's called? Yeah, middle IR. <laughs> um, and looking at that, and it's like, okay, well, we're looking there, and it looks 
reasonable. So something in between going from the MER to the LVMIR is where the issue seems to be. And, and a can, lot of can, it, can I ask Lukeman, what what in the MER was it that you were familiar with it and it seemed fine based on your expertise or that you were sort of less familiar, but nothing stood out as obviously wrong? Um, a bit familiar with it, not like super, but still okay. it, it, enough to say that, okay, this looks reasonable. Okay. Like not enough. obviously fucked up. Still might be a problem, but like yeah. enough to move on. Got it. Yeah. Enough to like at least say, I, I don't see how we went from this MER to this LVMIR. Like there's a disconnect here. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then it was kind of just like verifying those assumptions, you know, in the code and figuring out like a lot of the more like, you know, details of how it actually works sort of thing. Um, and then also, and for me, at least with these kind of bugs, I always try to see if I can make, you know, like, um, a reproduction of it. There was already the example, but you know, use external crates a lot for compiler issues. I feel like if you can get it to a single file, that's yeah. great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it was like, okay, now that I sort of have an idea of what's going on here, can I kind of do that in a single file? And here it was kind of getting lost for a while. It's like trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I get Rust to use an invoke here? So Part of the issue was that it seemed to be because only happening when it was calling the inline assembly with a call instead of an, uh, an invoke instruction. So I guess to back up a little bit, inline assembly in LVM is uh, something that you would call like a function kind of hmm. okay. in their IR. So it's like you do something like call inline asm or invoke inline asm. The difference being you use invoke when you want to do the opt into the unwinding happening, the unwinding. So, you know, if you want to say my inline asm can potentially unwind and I want it to be participating in that, so you can use invoke to say, okay, if it does unwind, you know, go to this place to handle that. And so I got lost there trying to do the single file repo because I couldn't get it to use invoke until I realized, wait, this is because of the whole unwinding thing. And I think I mentioned somewhere in the article, it's like, okay, yeah, so if we actually tell it explicitly this as may unwind, we run into this problem. Hmm. But then it's like going back to the USDT example, we're not generating is you know inline assembly that can potentially unwind. So you know what's happening there. And from there, I think it was what part of me is just kind of paging this back <laughs> into what I was doing at the time. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like looking at the Rusty code and getting that epiphany, wait a second, there is, this is happening because we're doing this inside of an async block. And async blocks in the Rust compiler are co-generated using you know, generators. And then anything, like it's something like, if calls inside of that need to be handled, anything that can invoke inside of that needs to be handled so that they can poison the generator. It's like very much implementation specific stuff. Right, interesting. Yeah. So part of it was also actually just like looking at some old RFC and being like, okay, I understand why this is the way it is now. And so I have to say one thing I love about your write-up is as you are like digging in, you're always pointing out the flags that you're using. Um, and like dump mirror seems extremely useful. I feel like there's a, there, the, like, I want to understand mirror a lot better. Like I think we've done a lot of interesting things with Miri as well which is kind of tooling that relies on that layer. Uh, I just think there's a lot to understand there that uh, it seems like it's very valuable. And certainly you were using it to great effect here, Lukman. Yeah. Although it's, I feel like, yeah, Mirror is definitely very much implementation stuff right now. <laughs> implementation specific detail thing. It'd be cool if it had a tool for it to like just output it and then run optimizations directly on that, that kind of thing. But that's still a ways off, I think. Oh, you yeah. mean to sort of like out, kind of almost pause compilation in the middle, just show your work and then be able to examine it, make changes and resume that, that, that kind of idea? Yeah, like right now it can output it. it you can't actually consume any like textual mirror because right, right. it's, yeah, it's, it's like, mostly just like a, I think, debugging tool, at least right. from my perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. 
I mean, to, I mean, that almost gets back to, to Jordan's methodology of being able to insert yourself in the process and make modifications in the middle. And, and that was an avenue that wasn't available to you. Yeah. Besides yeah. recompiling. Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, it, I, I mean, so you were able to get to, I mean, you get this thing reproduced in it relatively tightly, which is obviously valuable. And then in terms of the actual, like, how do you fix this thing? And then, yeah, so it's like, it, I had already found kind of where we were going from the, you know, the Rust representation to the LVM. So I knew where this was happening. And once I kind of understood, like, all the kind of the moving parts about and the issue on the LVM side, too, it's like, okay, I understand. It's because the outputs that we were writing, we wrote them into the wrong basic block. Like, it was just a, you know... I guess just a bug that someone did, you know, while they're writing this up, unfortunately, you know, because we're all human. And it's like, okay, well, now I can verify my understanding. At, you know, it was like, I think three lines or something, just write the thing into the right block and recompile and test it. And it worked. Party flat. Yeah, totally. That must have, again, it must have felt great, just like with Jordan, when you're actually seeing the actual bit set or queried properly, it must have felt great to actually be like, hey, that's it. Like, that really validates my understanding of the problem. Yeah. Luke, when I know there was a very significant, or I think there was a very significant change to the way that ASM works in Rust fairly recently, and but it, but it must have been something... It can't have been related to that. Like it must have been some more recent update. Like, do you know, like, what change? Or this is not to cast blame, but to understand, like, what was in the vicinity that introduced this error. I I don't know that it was a recent change. Hmm. Oh, I think no, no. The right, the change. I think the reason why we noticed it was because of allowing inline assembly to participate in unwinding. That's what it was, yeah. I see, okay, interesting. Right, and it was all the, you know, the method, like the framework to handle all of that stuff. There was just like one little part that was missing, basically, and, is what and, ended up happening. And how frequent, I mean, is it because uh, async and asm is kind of a rare combination, is that? I think that's probably why, you know, it hadn't been probably, widely run into. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and for context, I mean, th th we're running a bunch of async code mm -hmm. and embedding dtrace probes within it. The dtrace probes are uh, macros that emit ASM blocks because that's the best way we could think of doing it. So all of a sudden, this uncommon thing became very common. Right. Well, and what I love about this, Lupin, is you kind of like go through this debugging it I think I understand it. Fix the fix the compiler. Okay, that fixes the problem. That tells me I definitely understand it. And then you're able to go back to a reproduction that's now even tighter. And it must have been great when that site faulted on playground. That that that, that had to have been a good feeling. <laughs> yeah, it's like I can easily point at this now. You know, it's yeah, like very small, well contained, doesn't need to rely on anything else. And I think that, you know, it's it, it, someone just seeing the bug report may wonder like, oh, this person like wrote this and it didn't work. It's like, no, no, this, there was a huge amount of work that led up to this very simple uh, reproduction. But it, it, it is great. Boy, it is really nice to have a, a simple. And I love being able to do that. I, I mean, it's so satisfying when you go from very complicated, rare problem mm -hmm. to being able to understand it to wait a minute, if I understand it, then if I just do this, I should be able to reproduce it. I feel like that's like one of the greatest feelings in software engineering, I gotta tell you, when you're able to, 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 to make that, because it just feels so affirming of your own understanding. And to go back to what we were talking about earlier about like teaching other people, I really loved that Lukeman put the reproduction, reproduction, uh, reproduction example on a playground link and not just like, as a code block in the, in the gist or, or the blog post. Like you could actually go run it yourself. I just I, thought that was really cool. Oh, I think it's great. You can go site fault it yourself. Everyone can go site fault it. <laughs> you know, one of the things about these minimal reproducers, exactly as you say, Luke and Brian, often it's like the last step. 
And yeah. when you often when you read bug reports, it's presented as the first step. And yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's the thing you know that that a you know uh, this kind of narrative shows you that it was the validation of your understanding, not the well. Here's the problem, and now let's go understand it. Uh, yeah, and then something I feel strongly about is when you have someone who is finding a bug in your own code or reporting a bug in your own code and has it as kind of won't necessarily take you on this long journey from these symptoms far away that I, I spent all this time distilling it down to this thing that is very tangible. It's part of the reason why you always want to be very appreciative when people approach a, a body of your software with something that's so tight. You'd be like, thank you very much for all of the work that you've done to get this so reproducible because you can, sometimes it's not a lot of work, but oftentimes I think people have done a lot of work to be able to get it down to something that's so tight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that was great. And then, so looking with this kind of same question for you as for Jordan, th then what prompted you, you've done this? This is terrific work. But then you also choose to like write the whole thing up. And also, as with Jordan's, like you showed some things that like you explored that were not, that didn't end up being it, or that you, you kind of like, you showed all of your notes. Um, it, w what kind of prompted that write up? Well, I mean, yeah, like I think the inspiration in this case, well, it's definitely like Jordan's. Um bug report that we were just talking about, like that was shared, like, I think not very much before this, like around when this was happening. So I was like, that, you know, that was an amazing read. I feel like I learned so much about it. It was like, it was going through the journey too. And I was like, I already have a lot of basically the content of what I wrote, you know, scattered about in my terminal history, just like scratch pad notes. So I was like, I can take that all and now collate it into this actual, you know, journey of going through this bug, figuring it out, fixing it. It's, you know, something to do while I'm waiting for things to recompile anyways. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is awesome. And Jordan, that must be especially gratifying for you to hear. Um, it, because I think it, like, if people are wondering how you create a culture where debugging is valued, like this is a big part of that is that you, that, you know, getting inspired by one's colleagues um, and I mean, Jordan, that's that, that's great that your work was able to inspire a colleague to. It was, to that was like the work. nicest thing anyone's ever said to me at work. <laughs> it, was, it was so nice, and also because Lukeman's like bug report was amazing and had a meme in it. It's like, well, okay, the bar I, has been raised. I, the bar has been. I, Jordan, I'm glad you mentioned the meme. It's not just a meme; it's a Scooby Doo meme. I feel <laughs> like Scooby Doo is the universal language. Uh, it transcends generations. Um, <laughs> my, my, my own children, I think, aspire to be Scooby-Doo scholars based on the, uh, the intense Scooby-Doo based debate that happens in our household. Um, so I thought the Scooby-Doo meme was just genius. <laughs> yeah, no, I was trying to figure out, you know, I was like, there's a lot of text here. I need something to break it up. Yeah. And you pretty much, I, I mean, I think you, you, you nailed it. Um, and I, except you've, you, you've raised the bar for all of us. I think that we uh, <laughs> get, get more, more, more memes, memes and debugging. Um, but that I think really, really cool stuff. And I thought uh, the, I think what was also neat is that with both of these, I love the fact that, um, both of you were doing this in the public. You'll mean these are open source projects we're working on and it must've been neat for both of you to see the, you know, we, we, we kind of both of these got put out on social media and then a lot of people were interested in it. That must've been gratifying. Yeah, <laughs> it was interesting. Cause I think you had posted it um, <laughs> while I was like away from like even looking at Twitter or anything. And I then think I come back movie, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I come back and I was like, Oh, this is like hundreds of notifications. And I'm like, what, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> And what had happened is I had, okay, so sorry, I had submitted this to Hacker News. Because I usually, when I, there are things like this, I feel like this is the stuff Hacker News should care about. Like, instead of all of the, th there's plenty of stuff that Hacker News cares about that I don't think they should care about. I think, like, people should care about these kind of bugs. So I always kind of submit these things to Hacker News. And I, in part, you know, looking at it. I mean, it's, it's literally Hacker News. It is literally news for hackers. I, Look, you had a great hook in it with a chief and unlocked Rusty Segfault. And so you came back to this being a number one story on Hacker News, which probably was not <laughs> what you were expecting. No. Um, <laughs> but I thought it was really cool. And, and I, you know, I thought it was great. And it, like, it stuck there for 
hours and which I thought was really awesome, honestly, because I think it's, this is the kind of thing like this is the kinds of things that we should be broadcasting broadly within our domain. This is everyone's got something to learn from this. And I think, you know, this gets us out of kind of, you know, the debates of the day or what have you. And um, so I, I think this is, it was terrific. I, I, I was really glad to see. Ultimately, it's like it's kind of like people are responsible for deciding what's important in hackers and what's not. Ultimately, you know, and the fact that so many folks gravitated to it, I thought was really cool to see. Yeah, I feel like although I got the inspiration for the title part from was it Steve Kopnik's first response to this when Patrick posted it, he was like, <laughs> "Oh no!" Slash, congrats. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Which is, it is kind of an oh no slash congrats. I mean, it's, it, it is, uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that actually both of these bugs had in common that I, um, and I want to understand from both of you about this, because both of these bugs were more or less dead reproducible, a term that apparently I only, only I <laughs> use. Did we, have we, have I had this conversation, Adam? I don't think well, we've done it on the space, no. But also people who, uh, that you've infected with it. It, it, yes, it is. It is. I am the typhoid Mary of dead reproducible, and I don't know where I came up with. It. Jordan, do you use this, Did, or maybe are you? Were you previously? I think I do now. I don't know. Okay. And, and possible wait to, to clarify for the rest of us, what what exactly does that mean? Well, what do you think it means, Lukeman? Always reproducible. No, yes, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Lang- there you go. It's a, a, a language. It's an, an intensifier. And we, so okay. But this is one of those things that I, it was a term that like, I, like everyone uses this term and I just, and I wanted, this is embarrassing. I'm like, I think I wanted to put it in a tweet about one or the other of your bugs. And I'm like, dead reproducible, hyphen or not. So I didn't know, like, do I do the hyphen or not? And I just wanted to check it out. And so I Googled dead reproducible in quotes. And there's like this moment of horror where it's like, there are only three pages of results and they are all me. Or people I know. This is like the end of the usual suspects. This <laughs> oh, is a, totally this is. This is a long con that you have perpetrated <laughs> against yourself for decades. Oh, absolutely. And I'm like, what do you, what? And then there's this moment of like, have I had, is this like the equivalent of like having lettuce on my teeth for 25 years? I mean, <laughs> nobody have, said anything. Nobody said anything. And it's just like, is this something like, oh, no, no, no. Like, you're dead reproducible guy. Like, we all think it's weird, but no one wants to say anything. Like, you would say something, right? I hope. Sure. <laughs> oh, God. No, that's not at all. That's that, that's not at all convincing. But so a term that I I think it's a useful term as opposed to completely reproducible. So I'm going to – I would like to say this world. I'm going to continue to use it. I, I don't care. I know that I apparently sound nuts, but it, it's, it's okay. just – We'll put it on your tombstone. It Please, dead reproducible. Dead reproducible is fine. Reproduce, dead. reproduce <laughs> in peace. Reproduce in peace, exactly. But I, so I do. The, the it is very satisfying when. Oh, so when you have a bug that's dead reproducible, there's a there's a solace in it, in that you feel like. I, and I sometimes I have to tell myself like, if it's dead reproducible. I can debug it. It may take me a very, very, very long time. I may take a very indirect route, but if it's completely reproducible, and I, you know, one thing I've, I've said before is that bugs may be either psychotic or non-reproducible, but not both. When you have a bug that is psychotic and non-reproducible, that is going to take a very long time to debug. You're going to need to get lucky, and we've had a handful of those in my career, and those have been absolutely brutal. But in general, bugs are either psychotic or non-reproducible. In this case, like, these bugs are, are pretty gnarly. Both of these bugs are, are pretty gnarly, but the, but the reproducible. Did you think, uh, uh, Jordan Lupin, did you kind of have that solace as well? Like, I uh, did, does that help your determination to know, like, if I sit here long enough, I can debug it? Yes, totally. I, I feel like a lot of debugging is very emotional. <laughs> totally. And, and, and being able to just reassure myself that there there is an answer on the other side. Uh, is is very useful. It, it is very useful. Though I totally agree that a lot of debugging is emotional. I think that is actually a very pithy way of putting it, Jordan. Because I think you're right. It can be really a struggle, especially if you feel like I'm not making progress. I am like, I'm just like taking laps through this problem, and I'm not getting anywhere. 
one thing that I tell people is if you've got a problem like that, um, maybe spend some time and write some tooling. Maybe that's a good time to write some tooling, actually, because then you can feel like, well, I didn't debug it, but I implemented equals J for the jazz. Format. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> You're just ready for the next time. Yeah, yeah, you're ready for the next time. But I, of, I often find that also just in doing that, it feels like I'm doing something, and then it often helps my emotional state as I go back to attack the problem. Jordan, do you find that to be the case as well? Yeah. Um, another thing, I've said this a lot publicly, but uh, in one of the very first CS courses I took, one of the things our professor said was that there is no magic in the yes. course. And that is something I find almost like a mantra, <laughs> like repeating to myself, like there is, there is no magic. This is all, even if it's very complex and deep and there's years and years of history here, there, it's not magical. It's all knowable. It's yeah. all knowable. No, I totally agree. And I also kind of feel then like you also have when you've got a bug, and I, this is not true for either of these, but when you've got a bug where it's like, these are wildly varying symptoms or these symptoms are crazy and just knowing hey i th this is going to be w when i figure out when we figure out what's the, the, the kind of the common strain is across these wildly disparate symptoms it's going to make for a great story i kind of feel like well i can't wait to understand because there's i feel like and, and maybe you feel this as well in terms of bugs you can remember where you've got bugs like this can't possibly be a single issue that is manifesting these wildly disparate symptoms. And then you debug it, you're like, oh, right, of course. Yes, that makes sense. And wow, that's really interesting that this single symptom had the, the, the single cause had these wildly different symptoms. Yeah. Like in that sense, like a psych fault that happens every single time, give me those kinds of bugs all the time. Please. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's like so much easier when you have something like that. No, <laughs> Versus... other, rather than the, like 10,000 things happened and then one out of a hundred times we get a sick mm -hmm. fault, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, but... it, it, yeah, it's a beauty of uh, when the compiler fails, it does tend to do so relatively deterministically, which is a real beauty of compiler bugs. Yeah. But, I mean, like you said, I feel like we can make the tooling better. Like that's why things like, you know, I really like um, RR time travel trace, those kind of things. Like if you can keep it running attached the whole time and then when you finally run into it, you can finally, you can debug backwards. Like, I think that's amazing. I, it's amazing. Yeah. And the, I think the other key, the key is that like, if you've got a problem that's amenable to that, it's great. And yeah. I, th I think that the, there's not going to be one debugging methodology to rule them all. And like Jordan, I thought it was right. interesting that like you started in trying one methodology post morning debugging. And then had to switch, like, oh, that's not going to work. Like, this doesn't work in this case. I got to move to a different methodology. I got to use in situ debugging for this instead. Um, and, you, like, we've got to be flexible about the kind of methodology we use on any given problem. Yeah, that was my first time using MDB as a step debugger. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Right. It was and great. Is it, is yeah. MDB and KMDB or just MDB Sorry, full stop? I mean, it was KMDB. No, just, just wondering. Yeah, there was yeah. definitely yeah. a moment where you were like, why did nobody tell me about this? You're like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I might I might have said that. <laughs> well, there one thing that was really nice uh, was being able to do like with the breakpoint command, you can give it a command to run every time it hits the breakpoint. So like when I was figuring out when I thought the code was looping and not hanging, I found where I was incremented and printed the value there and then just continued. So I didn't have to keep like, you know, pressing step or whatever. Um, and that was that was magical. Yeah, that was, cool. well, that was cool, and I love the fact that you you, you described that as well. Um, in the, in, in the bug report, which is great. Um, and yeah, I think that the you know, institute debugging is when it's useful. It, it, I think that there are a couple of things like this that it's like it's this technique technique that when it's useful, it's extraordinarily useful. But it's it's not useful for every problem. I mean, it's useful for. I certainly feel that way about like Adam. I don't know if, if there are D trace features where that that. that uh, come to mind on this, but I feel that way about anonymous tracing. Anonymous tracing allows us to trace during boot, which is the kind of thing you don't care about until it saves your life. <laughs> yeah, um, similarly, like speculative tracing, right? Like for for again those kinds of um, problems that happen one time out of a hundred, one time out of a thousand. Um, you know, there 
maybe not so common, and it's a, I, I don't know how many folks have used speculative tracing, but similarly. I can't but, imagine it's that many, right? I mean, I, I thought you were going to make some sort of blanket statement about 80% of the people that have used speculative tracing to debug a problem are oh. actually in this Twitter space right now. That may be the case, <laughs> but I still think it's pretty useful. It's super useful. And I, I think that the, the other thing that I think it, it, it highlights is that the all of these things have arisen from the need to debug specific kinds of problems. And I think having your, this is why it's so important to debug debugging tooling when you have a bug in front of you because you are much more likely to debug to, to develop tooling that is itself useful when you're debugging a problem because it's the problem that motivated the tooling. So I saw a couple of other folks asking to speak here. I don't know if you've got uh, either questions for Jordan Lukeman or, or your own uh, war stories, your own thoughts on debugging methodology. Um, but uh, I don't know if uh, Nating in Captivity or Jason wanted to get in here. But, um, well, I just from earlier, and I just don't know if I misheard or not, because you're asking about, you know, with the the night, you know, with Rust, you know, how you can do like the underscores and everything. And were you commenting that you know, it was nice to have it MDB, or are you commenting it would be nice to have it in MDB? So, does, M does MDB have the ability to put uh, uh, underscores in, in? Well, that's why I was asking because Robert put it in. So it's like, <laughs> oh, what? Jeez. That's embarrassing. God, first yeah. Rust Analyzer, and now I'm sorry, Robert. Sorry, Robert. It. Jeez. <laughs> exactly. So, you can have separators in, what was it, C++14. They're just the single quote, I think. So, sorry. Like, as a digit separator, like the underscore in Rust, right? But you can do it in C++, I think, 14. Oh, C++. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, no, I, and I think... I also think that you can do that in, I mean, I was using kind of, I was using uh, Helio with XC, uh, and I think that there are many C extensions allow that as well. It's just, it's, it's been a really nice thing to have in Rust. It's been, it's, it's one of the, the, one of the nice things that Rust lets us have, as Steve is fond of saying. Yeah, and, and I will admit that I am such a cave person that I have not used it in any other, uh, other language. Well, at this point, uh, I mean, I feel like, I mean, virtually everything I'm doing is in well, Rust, and yeah, yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, exactly. Kind yeah. of a, we're doing a, doing a lot of stuff in Rust, obviously. Well, this is great. Um, I don't know. If, if, again, if, I don't know. Other folks have got questions or, or, or comments, but um, th this was uh, Jordan Lukman. This was terrific. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed. I obviously really enjoyed reading um, both of your write-ups. I love the fact that Jordan's inspired Lukman's, even though they're on totally different subjects. Uh, and, you know, I would say that this is an aspect of our culture that we would love others to copy, please. Like, this is, uh, I, I think we would be well served as a, as a discipline to uh, encourage one another to debug problems, encourage one another to actually write them up for our both our own understanding and Jordan, as you said, uh, off the jump uh, pedagogically so we can, we can teach others um, how, to, uh, how to actually debug. So, um, I, Ben, did you have a closing comment you want to get in here? Oh, no, I was, yeah, don't. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, we could hear a little bit about the uh, debugging adventure that I started for you with the UD2 inserted on uh, Get Unchecked. Oh, yes. The, the, yes. The, uh, this was the triple fault, right? Yeah, I uh -huh. believe. Yeah, this is the uh, Rick is here and was had jumped in on that one. Um, I was not debugging that one. I was uh, I was definitely a spectator to that one. Um, I don't know if Rick, if you're in a position to just to speak about the details. Ben, had you uh, that was uh, I guess you had seen the the consequences of that one. <laughs> but we are in a super um, weird environment. Yeah, so when I implemented this, I had some idea of the chaos that I would produce. Um, <laughs> because, because, right, that's why I, I confirmed that it would detect a couple bugs that I detected in other crates, right? With this, you know, sort of just sudden sig ill in the middle of your test suite, which is not the best experience. And so I was, my, my initial fear was that people would report this as Rust bugs. Like, the compiler broke. R right. Well, that's not what happened to us. Um, so you, do you want to describe a little bit about the work that you did to introduce the UD2? Uh, yeah. um, and then... Sure. So 
There's a number of uh, unsafe APIs, especially in core. And uh, a significant fraction of them have predicates which are checkable at runtime, but like the whole point of the unsafe function is that it's not checked. And so this has been tossed around in the community for actually a pretty long time that like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if these were checked in debug mode, right? So, so you, you write your code, you know, with, with get unchecked or non-null, you know, new unchecked or something like that. And then, you know, you, you do the wrong input and then in release mode, you get undefined behavior or whatever, right? But in, in debug mode, you get a test failure. Um, so trolling through the, the implementations in core, someone else had come through. I, I think it was Ralph, Ralph J, Ralph Young, uh, came through and implemented a um, little wrapper that instead of launching a panic in the interest of code size and compile time would call core intrinsics abort, which just compiles down to the fastest way to halt the program which on x86 is just a UD2. So you just get a branch to a UD2. And so I just sprinkled these everywhere that I could think of in core and put up a PR. And, and so it should be said that UD2 is, a, is defined to be an undefined instruction. And that will generate a, if you are on a, uh, running as a process that should generate a sig ill or its equivalent. And you should ideally have something that you can debug because you've got a core dump, you've got all this the two-way, um, which is presumably the reason that you wanted to sprinkle the UD2s everywhere. Uh, so I, really what I wanted to do was produce something which is unambiguously an error. Uh, and so yes, I, I found it useful because I have my desktop configured to collect core dumps whenever anything crashes. So for me, it's super easy to dive into whatever's going on. Um, so I, I, I found occasionally useful. Actually, I, I fiddled with the PR a little uh, trying to see if I could get a workflow down where I could tell people, oh, you just open up GDV, do this, right? And you'll get a backtrace that'll point you straight into the function that you screwed up in. The backtraces are close that you can get on a sort of desktop environment or a hosted environment, but they're not, they're not ideal. But of course, and, and this is obviously not something you could necessarily know, uh, but we are using Rust in this case in a very, very, very different environment where we are effectively in a, a bootloader that has no net underneath it. This is very, very, very low level software. This is as we are starting the host CPU and taking it, taking, uh, executing an undefined instruction uh, is gonna have, uh, a, we are actually going to what's called the triple fault where the machine is gonna effectively reset. So Rick, you're here. Do you wanna describe, know that you and John Gallagher and a bunch of folks were debugging this inside of Oxide. Do you wanna describe kind of what the manifestation of this was? Yeah, so as as Brian just said, we normally when you boot an x86 machine, like it, it comes into the reset vector and that's going to run some startup code at, for EFI or, or BIOS or, you know, whatever your firmware stack is. In our case, we don't do that. So when we come out of the uh, reset vector, we actually jump directly into uh, Rust code. And in our case, it's a very small bare metal bootloader system called Nano Blurs, uh, Nano BL RS. And because it's extremely minimal, um, you know, we, we've been using this for basically doing development work. And so its main feature is like it gives you kind of the KMDB style interface, um, but at a bare metal, you know, ring zero context and has the ability to do things like receive data over X modem, so you can load binaries into RAM. Uh, Rick, people may be wondering if they heard you correctly when you said X modem. Yes, X yes modem. Yes, X modem. <laughs> Year of our Lord 2022, X modem. Um, and, it, you know, this is, this is all happening over a serial port. It's, it, the intent is we want to be able to actually test out our, the early bring up code for the system. And so this gives us just a, an initial entry point. But because it was written to be extremely minimal, it skips some steps. And so some of the steps that it skips are things like loading what's called the IDT, or the uh, interrupt descriptor table. So there's no interrupt handlers, because it doesn't generate any interrupts. There's no hardware enabled to run any interrupts. Or so it thinks. <laughs> um, 
Well, I said interrupts. <laughs> right, However, sure. exceptions also go through the IDT. And exceptions are something that can happen, for example, when you run a UD2 instruction. So in our case, the, the way this manifested was if we updated the, the tool chain for nanoblurs and you loaded it, it would just hang. You would run certain commands and it would just hang. And it wasn't, there, there's no output because literally when you hit the situation, um, you know, it, it, the machine is already in an extremely low level state. There's no error handling hooked up. So the machine doesn't have any way to indicate what went wrong. So we spent a fair amount of time just trying to figure out what error path was being hit. Was it spinning in a loop? Was it waiting for something? Or had it done a triple fault? And uh, so we had a, a, a couple people working different avenues. I was uh, grabbing the AMD's actual hardware debugging uh, interface and trying to get the processor to give me information in this situation where it's hung. And the best I could get was all the x86 cores shut down and it wouldn't tell me why. But we, because we knew that the x86 core shut down, it was pretty good guess that what had happened was a triple fault. So that got us at least going back and, and instead of, because if it was spinning in a loop or something, I should be able to stop the processor and kind of inspect this, the, the architectural state of the, the processor. And I couldn't do that. Um, so once we, we knew it was a triple fault, we we're like, well, how in the world are you getting a triple fault? Like, we're not generating interrupts. There's nothing there. And that's when we finally started coming around to, oh, it must be generating an exception. Um, and, you know, it took us quite a while to, to dig through this and started looking at uh, disassembly of various instructions and, and basically encountered this path of, in a certain situation, one of the crates we were using had some... Uh, undefined behavior, and that was being encoded as a UD2. And when you hit the UD2, it goes to fire the exception handler, It goes at, which goes to look up in the IDT. There's no entry in the IDT for the exception handler, so the processor just gives up and turns off. And, it, I mean, it's worth saying that this is not necessarily our first thought that we... I mean, we, we've got all sorts of things that could be happening that would that would be much darker um so it, this is and this failure mode is just brutal uh in, in general the triple fault failure mode is really unfortunate and brutal um and it is a very difficult failure mode to to debug um but ricky you had something else that actually i just want to mention briefly wasn't the case in i don't think although actually jordan you mentioned talking about to josh and robert about this i i think that one of the things i love about D debugging is that it's a real team sport in that people can explore different avenues in parallel in a way that's kind of much easier than when you're developing software together. I think it's much easier to debug in parallel than sometimes to develop software in parallel. And Rick, as you said, like people were kind of, everyone was kind of exploring different hypotheses um, on that, that triple fault, if I recall correctly. Yeah. I mean, we, it, because we couldn't inspect the machine in that state, right. I, I was kind of the only person who really equipped to, to do that. Um, other people were just looking at various code gen outputs, trying to compare between builds that seemed to work fine and builds that didn't to see what functions were different. Of course, when you change the compiler version, all the functions look different. So that didn't really help narrow things down. And so, th yeah, there were just a whole bunch of different avenues. Honestly, on our bingo card, undefined behavior in a crate that we depended upon was pretty low on the list. <laughs> pretty low on the list. I mean, it's a relief, honestly. It's the best possible answer um, because it is, it's something that we can definitely fix in lots of different ways. But yeah, it was low. I was surprised. It was low on the list. It actually was one of these that we were just talking about, about like, you know, how do you get from there to there? And Ben, had, were you surprised to see uh, the kind of the manifestations of this be and in terms of how we hit this? Uh, not particularly. I okay. was, All right. I, was, I, I was a little bit surprised that I, I mean, just my priors maybe, but I was, I was surprised that I only heard about it after it was fixed, not the <laughs> screaming in pain as attempting to debug it. 
Yeah, well, we, you know, we're very used to being self-sufficient in this regard. Uh, so, and actually, but I gotta say, I, one thing I really appreciated in this is um, that when you, uh, that you, you kind of volunteered, like, hey, this is, sorry, I introduced this, and uh, I want to help, I, I want to understand, like, what the failure mode was. I, that's, honestly, that felt great from our perspective, just to, um, it, it, you know, I think debugging is so, needs to be so collaborative, and, and uh, you know, obviously, this was um, a, a change that you were making that was very well intentioned and had very surprising ramifications and also did, uh, I mean, point us to, I mean, it should be said, like the, the, the root cause is really the fact that we had this crate that was doing something it shouldn't be doing. Um, it, yes, maybe this shouldn't be a capital crime <laughs> for the program, but uh, that was the actual fix was to fix Heapless. And I think we ended up fixing that Rick, if I recall correctly, we ended up making uh, finding a couple of other issues and, and fixing, or, or I think we ended up looking at the heapless dependency carefully. Maybe that's the best way to say it. Uh, so, so John Gallagher started running Nano Blur's builds under. Oh, uh, there's a tool that that looks specifically for uh, undefined behavior type issues. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Okay. So I'm also a Miri contributor. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. So of particular interest, if you're if you're intensive users of Miri, um, I finally um, managed to merge a PR this weekend. I don't know when it will appear in Rust Nightly. Um, that significantly enhances the diagnostics when it tells you about a stacked borrows error. Ooh, that so is if, awesome. If you have any sorts of feedback on Miri. One of the, the biggest problems is that the core Miri contributors are seriously starved for feedback from users or the community in general. So whatever you have, however you can send it to me, issues, Twitter, would be great. Oh, I do, will do. That's great. That is great to hear. And that's, uh, I mean, I, I think Miri played, a, I mean, played a very load-bearing role in this, uh, in John's analysis of this. So, um, and... Uh, they pointed us to the undefined behavior that we need to go fix. Yeah, and, and to be fair, this also pointed to we uh, we really should implement an IDT yeah, and exactly. specifically an exception handler to catch and dump the state to the UART. Yeah, I think that there's kind of another object lesson in there too, isn't there, Rick? About the, the, sometimes you think, like, this shouldn't happen. And so, well, I don't really need to handle it. It's like, well, if it shouldn't happen, like, all the more reason to put something in there that is going to make it very clear that it has happened, um, because it, if you don't, the, the, the consequences of again, the consequences of taking a fault without an IDT are pretty grave in x86. And as I recall, I think uh, that also inspired Dan Cross to add to Nano Blurs an actual like an IDT that actually does a register dump, if I recall correctly. Um, so if we see this again. We will see. Um, I mean, we'll. It will be night and day in terms of being able to debug where this is coming from. Exactly. Yeah. And and I mean, this all kind of came into. Let's go spend some time to update Nano Blurs to the latest tool chain and and you know, see what other problems we have lurking because we've just been lucky and and we got away with it for a long time. Um, but now that we we know we're not quite as lucky anymore. Let's let's go in and put in some of the infrastructure so that we know when something goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, and on, honestly, Ben, your work did ultimately like really improve the system. Yeah, the it, it improved our own failure mode in this case. It improved our use of heapless for sure. So, uh, it's good stuff. And um, thanks again for for your work on it and for Miri as well. Um, it was uh, it's been really valuable stuff. Yeah, always always glad to hear your work's appreciated. Thanks. Yeah, that was, and that was a good one. That was another fun one. I, I, I do, uh, it's so, again, not one that I actively participated in, but it was really fun to watch people, different people investigating different hypotheses, going different directions, and then finally getting that one to, to total and complete understanding. And Rick, great work from you and John Gallagher and a bunch of other folks that, that were working on that one. Um, and Luke, I feel like you were in on that one as well. I feel like there's, there's, there's again, there's like a, there's a disturbance of the force whenever there's a, whenever Russ is involved, and you're off and uh, in there with. with yeah, I, th I think it was very limited. That one, maybe just like which it was something like which commit broke something or something like that, but very limited. I, I, another thing that I also just maybe to close on, I, I think that 
one aspect of this is, and yes, we've been using IRC forever, but especially in this all remote world, we, we use chat a lot for debugging. Um, and, you know, Lupin, you said, mentioned this earlier that like you, you are able to kind of lurk when someone's debugging and then be able to find ways to help. Um, I also think that when people are talking about the problems they're hitting and how they're debugging them in chat, it's it can be a good way for other people to see and, and, mm-hmm. and help out. And it's changed the way we, we debug software for sure. All right. I know Adam has gone off to uh, – Adam has let the recording run, but I know he – Yes. Oh, there you, Adam. You're oh, here. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening along. You know, uh, negotiating with the toddler, but but still here. Uh, nice. awesome. what, 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 the, the toddler is so supports us adding an IDT to nano blurs, I assume. Uh, he's um, he's ambivalent. I would <laughs> he's say. Ambivalent, right? Exactly. Uh, well, you tell him he can debug the next problem where we have. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been really great. Um, Jordan Lukman, thank you so much for, for this. Um, and Josh, Rick, thank you. And, and Ben, thanks for your, for your work on Miri. It's been um, a, a lot of fun to talk. Uh, debugging methodology is a uh, subject that is near and dear to our hearts. So uh, always fun to, to compare notes.